Hi, and welcome to episode 48 of season two of the Connect 2 podcast and season 100 of the podcast overall. Epis- so a, episode 100. Episode season 100. Season 100, we would be like, hello there. <laughs> episode 100. Young yes, whippers never. That's right. <laughs> I think they are season 100 of the Survivor show, though, aren't they? Well, know? that's yeah. true, but they kind of, uh, they kind of cheat with the episodes. <laughs> So uh, if you're new to the channel, rate, review, and subscribe. We're actually videotaping this too. That's right. Oh, um, we didn't introduce ourselves. I'm Jeff Cullum. I'm Mark Hughes. And, and the Sparkster is back. The Sparkster is back. Um, he doesn't usually appear when we're just audio yeah. because why would he? So woo! Yay, congratulations, Happy birthday. Mark. Yeah, 100, so far. 100 episodes. Yeah, episode 200 coming up. <laughs> yeah, right, right around the corner. <laughs> So today we have coffee again, of as course, usual. as usual. All right. So I'm going to pour it a little, uh, hopefully some uh, ASMR. Um, I don't even know what that stands for. There's one for you and one for me. There you go. Thank you. And uh, today's coffee is from Vancouver, from the Modus, Modus Coffee Roastery. It's a Guatemalan. That's pretty good. It's called D-O-M. What are, the, what are your tasting notes? Uh, hmm, that's interesting. I don't know. Let's try that again. I don't get these. It's a bit bitter, so... It is a marshmallow trail mix and milk chocolate. Wow. I'm not getting trail mix. Well, I think the bitterness might be a little bit. Mm. Yep. Could be. It's not really bitter. It's kind of. <laughs> anyway, there you go. A wonderful time had by all. Hey, got any all dad right. jokes? I have a couple of good dad jokes. Oh, excellent. So, uh, what happens if you put, uh, what do you get if you put root beer in a square glass? I don't know. Beer. <laughs> <laughs> What's the definition of a faux pas? I don't know. A man who tells dad jokes but has no children. <laughs> and I got one more. All right. Why was Martin Luther King so fond of the snooze button? I don't know. He wanted to keep the dream alive. Oh, man. <laughs> What's the difference between Boba Fett and a time machine operated by Marty McFly? I don't know. One's a Mandalorian, the other ends is a, a man, man and a DeLorean. DeLorean. Oh, yes. I should have known that, actually. <laughs> I got arrested today for walking out of an art museum with painting. I'm just so confused early because he earlier said, asked the security if I could take a picture, and he said yes. <laughs> and uh words matter oh my god what the hell is that a geography teacher asked if i could name a country with no r in it and i said no way <laughs> there you go that is uh that is my i uh jokes for today i I think they might be Norwegian. They might be. Da- I think they're Norwegian. Um, I just have a new tailor. This is not a dad joke. This is natural. And I'm pretty sure they were Nor- either Norway or Denmark. You know, you think I would have paid attention, but they were very serious, obviously, about this whole uh, uh, Nordic uh, Viking heritage because okay. they literally have a suit of chain mail in their living room. Really? And I saw their wedding pictures and. Uh, I only I've only met the the lady, but her husband was dressed in full uh, armor for their wedding pictures, and she was on a white horse. And I'm like, man, you guys are taking this whole Viking thing pretty seriously. She did not disagree. <laughs> <laughs> um, Bring back the Vikings, I say. They'll straighten everything out. Some say they never left. Well, uh, what'd you learn this week? Ah. <sighs> oh. Okay, this will be my one cynical con- comment for the episode. I learned that you can bring a man to the polls, but you can't make him think. <laughs> well, an, an alternative to that is you can't fix stupid. Yeah. It, you know, it's not stupidity. If it's, if it's, it's not, not apparent, this is the day after yeah. the Alberta election. You know, it is not stupidity. I think my wife and I have talked about this at length. There's a... Uh, 
I'm reading this book, right, called How to Speak to a Science Denier. Mm -hmm. It really comes down to identity and fear. And tribalism. And tribalism. And generative and, voting. And a need to belong. And, you know, unfortunately. Yeah, and they're cheering for the colors. The duality is as much our fault as it is the other side. Because when you don't try to go out and hear people, you know, whatever their fears or concerns or worries are about the <sighs> gays are taking over, or, you know, for us, it seems ridiculous. But until you can appreciate that somebody has legitimate concerns, and if you just go, bah, what the hell's wrong with you, right? You don't get any traction. And it requires a huge amount of, of patience and, and meditation, I think, to be able to do that. But I think that's what we need to do. You can't just be dismissing people as kooks. I mean, some of them are kooks. Some of the people leading behind. But I think a lot of these folks are decent people. They like this. You know, if you could do uh, um, two Venn diagrams of shit that they find important, there'd be a real degree of overlap. But there's some stuff that they are deeply worried about, deeply concerned about. And I think we do a poor job of giving them, you know, uh, I'm going to say respect in some reports. And I'm as guilty of this as well, because you get caught up in the rhetoric, right? Same in the States, you know, you have some of these MAGA extremists and it's kind of fun to make fun of them. And some of the progressive websites like to show people what the ridiculous thing they say. But at the end of the day, there's something behind that. And uh, if you think the well, earth is I mean, flat, it's because you're afraid of something. <laughs> well, I think fundamentally the province itself is is a fairly is a fairly center center right kind of group of people, and I think all the UCP really needed to do, and what they somewhat successfully did, was convince a number of those people that yeah, we're the same party your dad voted for and his dad and all that. Yeah, kind of because I, basically I, in some way or shape or form for the last 88 years, other than a blip of four, four years, yeah, we've had the same kind of right wing party before it was so creds. I think and then it was a different animal though. These no, are not I, the same. I, I agree. It, yeah. it, there's a, there's a level of, um, well, I mean, the difference is, it's one thing to disagree with part. I, I kind of put it a tweet to this effect. It's one thing to disagree with a party, uh, party's policy. If you think that those people are still competent, okay. And fundamentally, yeah. the issue I had with the UCP, um, and, and you know, I I was going to vote NDP all along, uh, but uh, the reality is is that uh, losing to a competent party that you disagree with is one thing, but right. Losing to a party that is corrupt because uh, they they preach all kinds of ethics things like Absolutely. continuously. They seem to be incapable of staying on the straight and narrow, keeping their hand out of the cookie jar. Yeah, I mean it's yeah. just. But that's a, that's a sense of entitlement. The right, the the, the 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 lying, uh, the incompetence. I mean, they've really got what what's happened is because of the crazy nature of the 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 way that people get elected and how difficult it is to put yourself out there the only people willing to put themselves out there are a little bit narcissistic and um and they're not necessarily all that competent and in particular the ucp group of candidates they're wackos well a lot of them yeah absolutely not all of them no. uh well, and, i said a lot of them yeah and um but not all of them and, and some it, of the ones that that have now lost you know were the perhaps the more <laughs> more rational more yeah reasonable. even though they were still ideological but i i i really think and it occurred to me this morning you know the ndp like you say they've only had one kick at the can there, there's a long history of well and there being... was a split there was a there was a three-way three parties right. there was the wackos yeah from the wild rose there was the progressive conservatives and then there were, it was an ndp it was a clearer yeah. clearer choice but see i i hope they learn from this because you know when you've been in 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 opposition and like my wife pointed out there was years since we've lived here where they had like you know two members yeah yeah right and so i i think they're still coming into their own as a as a significant party and i hope just building on what i've said for the next time around if they can go and find change their message a little bit be a little bit more 
you know, willing to, to listen. Because I think if you could get an NDP candidate from a small rural town, because the NDP here are not a really leftist party. No, they're pretty If you centered. can find a, a, a reasonable person who understands the concerns and you, it's a little bit like when Obama, you know, won because what was his message? You know, yes, we can. People don't like, I mean, it's kind of fun to be like the opposition. Like, what did they say? We might not be perfect, but at least we're not nuts. That doesn't really resonate with people, right? Because it's like well, you're it saying, it it's almost become oppositional. Are you saying if I like them, I'm nuts? You know, well, screw you. I'm going to vote for them anyways. You, you got to give people something to go towards yeah. and say, you know, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. And I think they, they need to get out into those rural areas, hear those folks, hear their, you know, because in a lot of cases, you don't even need to necessarily solve somebody's problem. You know, they just want to be acknowledged. Hey, I've got some fears about it before. Well, it's that old adage, right? People don't care what you know until they know how much you care. And I think that's a problem. Well, and, and, and but, it requires but, a lot of patience. But right but, now there's all this weird stuff like, uh, you know, the the discussion about, uh, Rachel Notley, uh, you know, and her, her Justin Trudeau cohorts, she didn't really get along all that well with Justin Trudeau when she was in power. Like, so this is a real, you know, yeah, and it's him just, and Jagmeet are, are, are her bosses. Her bosses. I'm going, yeah, you, you, you clearly haven't talked much to, to Rachel. She doesn't really, she doesn't toe that line. Um, secondly, the, the people blame like everything on, on Rachel Notley and without kind of seeing what's going on now, like and yeah. what, what went on before it's like this, it's, but it's this like, is the same playbook as in the States. Like right now, you know, there's people who are blaming Joe Biden for a bunch of stuff, uh, in the rhetoric about, you know, certain COVID things. And I mean, Interest rates, of the, interest rates they're of the, the kooky coalition of the MAGA, right? And then when rational journalists look at it, they're like, but that happened when, when Trump was in the way. Yeah, exactly. That happened when Trump was the president, right? Yeah. Doesn't so matter. Doesn't if, matter. To the average person sitting at home listening to Fox or Rebel Media, they just hear blah, 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 Justin Trudeau or blah, 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 Rachel Notley, you know. Well, whatever. let me, so anyhow. on a more positive side. Let me talk to you about something I learned that's totally different. Okay. What did you learn? So nuclear power. What's the problem with nuclear power? It's smelly. <laughs> no. It's it, it, generates it generates a lot of nuclear, nuclear waste. waste. Right. That's because right now we have what's called an open system where basically you go and mine uranium. Yep. You refine it to uranium U-235. Yep. And um, and then you you, pro, make, you make use it, it in rods. The, you put in your rods, and then then you're left over with spent fuel. Mm -hmm. Okay. In the '60s, however, they came up with a different plan called a closed closed feed, where basically you <laughs> which they immediately ignored. No, but they well, sort, this is too sort, good. Sort of. <laughs> so, but you, so what happens is you can actually mine the uranium yep you can process it and then you use it to heat and then you can recycle it and you can reuse the fuel if you have the right kind of reactor oh interesting and you can go through and use it like five or seven times it does two things two significant things right it changes the half-life from something like 200,000 years to about 200 years. Okay. The second thing that it is, does very significant. is it significantly reduces the volume of nuclear waste. Sure. Now, what happened in the late 70s um, was that uh, Jimmy Carter was really concerned about the proliferation of nuclear weapons. Okay. So they banned the recycling and the refining because oh, one of the byproducts okay. of the refining process is plutonium, which yes. can be used on in bombs. Yep. Even though uh, only a couple of years later, uh, when Ronald Reagan was in power, it was found that this 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 program wasn't really doing anything. Uh, he canceled that ban on uh, refining. Did he say? But well, a lot of the nuclear infrastructure was the was geared to one particular style of nuclear. And okay, but this technology is not new. This technology has been around since the '60s. Wow! And could significantly change and greenify 
nuclear, uh, power. nuclear power. And that's traditional, so fission. And there is enough nuclear waste currently in the U.S. Yep. That if they had nuclear waste recycling uh, reactors, yep. that they could power the, the U.S. for the next between 100 and 150 years without any coal or wow or um or natural gas or fossil fuels see the thing i believe is um the americans i mean as much as they are struggling when they get their mind when they like when they finally decide to do something they are a pretty formidable force yeah, like they, if they finally if they make the economic case and then it, or even in some cases they just decide it's the right thing it's the american thing to do once they get behind something, look out, man! Like they don't, they don't screw. Well, apparently, around. apparently, the main right. thing that's that's slowing it back is the uh, the cost. Right. So it's a cost thing right now, but it is if you think about it, they have all of these. They're called dry, dry casks where they store the nuclear waste. Right. Uh, it's all. Remember, for all they, they were they was talking about, we'll just put it at the bottom of the ocean, or we'll yeah. we'll, we'll have these missiles. We'll fire into the to the bed of the ocean, and then. Problem will just go away. Yeah, it's exactly. Like, yeah, I don't know about that. That's like carbon sequestration. Or maybe shoot it out onto the moon. And if there's, you know, if there's anybody living on the moon that we don't know about, that'll probably get their attention. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> hey, what the hell is this? So today, uh, today we're talking about transformative AI. Ooh. Okay. So I listen to a podcast and uh, I don't usually listen to podcasts twice, but I listened to this one twice because I was so wow. uh, taken back by the um, the concept there. So there is there um, there is a concept called a P doom. Have you ever heard of a P doom? No. So P doom is the probability at which uh, the human race is going to be doomed by something related to technology or AI. Okay. Okay. And so this so, is a happy episode then. <laughs> exactly. Oh man. So 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 uh so P Doom is basically the idea with P Doom is that um you know what what was what is your probability? Like do you have a just take a wild ass guess. I'm not asking for a calculation. But if you were to say what is the probability you think are um our our society civilization. And civilization is at risk of something bad happening as a result of technology in particular with ai technology hmm interesting ai technology up until i just listened to a podcast yesterday i would have said 60 percent, but i'm going to drop it now to about 40 <laughs> percent okay. based on what i just heard <laughs> okay well i was thinking more like 10 percent but uh, but what's interesting is and the the That's two, my two the, 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 the the podcast that I was listening to was Hard Fork and they drop every Friday and it's always super interesting. Hard Fork. Hard Fork. Okay. It's uh, two tech columnists, one from the New York Times and one from Platformer, okay. and they basically are always talking about new things AI and there is like a ton of stuff going on. Um, so everybody's heard of chat GPT probably. I mean, if you're paying any attention, chat GPT or the Bing version of chat GPT, right? The idea is that everybody's saying like, Oh, AI is getting to the point where basically it's kind of training itself. So there's a couple of key concepts to think about with this that make it super fascinating. So, um, so one of the things about it is that. Uh, some people will talk about these large language models uh, in a way where they say, well, it's a predictive thing. So it's just predicting what you think it wants you to hear. Okay. Okay. So, um, and that, that doesn't actually know anything about the subject matter that's involved, but that's not really true because, because the easiest way for it to be able to predict is if it actually does know something about the things that you're going to be talking about. So just, you know, saying that it's just a language thing is not enough. Like that is right. kind of a call and response. Hello, how are you? The appropriate response is I'm fine. How are you? Kind of that is. But if you start asking questions like um, uh, write me a speech in the Obama style of speech writing, it knows the speeches that Obama has done and right. the topics that 
So, so that's why their large language models are using a ton of information. Sure. Or if you're trying to do some calculations or whatever. So one of the things that became apparent between ChatGPT 3.5 the free one and mm -hmm. chat GPT four mm -hmm. is that um, some of the things like some of the scientific stuff and some of the math stuff okay. was really poor in 3.5, but is super good in 4.0. So there was like a massive over the course of about six months, a massive jump in just the, the chat GPT version. Right. Okay. So the question becomes at what point. So one of the things, one of the skills that, that, uh, chat gpt does is coding right you can tell it to build a code like build me a website that does this, right. this and this okay so the advantage of an ai is that it's drawing on huge amounts of information sure and it doesn't go to sleep right, right? so it basically can keep working on stuff so suppose you have a company like google okay so google is a software company they hire software engineers to do coding yep so presumably at some point in time you're going to first start with the uh the software engineers using the ai tools to help them code right until you get to the point where you don't need the software engineers to because now it's a manager and says i have these 12 ai bot agents i'm going to get this person this bot to work or this agent to work on this right this agent to work on that and then all of a sudden you end up particularly with a software company where you don't really need almost any people if you need any people at all i was gonna say pretty soon you don't need the manager either well <laughs> exactly and then so one of the ways that AI learns is uh, they call it reinforcement. So there's basically, it's, it's kind of like when you're training a dog. I was going to say, it's okay. kind of like a puppy. So basically you get uh, the behavior that you're looking for, and then you get the, um, the, the human provides kind of a right. positive reinforcement, like a thumbs up, a, not a real thumbs up, but kind of a, Proverbial. Nor do they hit it on the snout with a newspaper, exactly. which is not a way to train a dog no. positively either. So uh, a couple of things. So a lot of the the generative, the, a lot of the AI that's right now out there uses this human based positive reinforcement. So as they get it more correct, um, they get that positive thumbs up, a virtual right. thumbs up. And that's the driver for a lot of the development. Okay, so a couple of things that presented some real problems is a um, a lot of the like if you go to a mechanic and you say I need a, I, I need an engineer to design me a transmission for this car, right? Yeah. So that's a physical thing. Right. Right. Um, they'll know how it works. They they might tweak certain things, uh, but with the software engineers dealing with the AI, they don't actually know how it's doing stuff because right, right now sure. they've kind of set the framework in place and now the AI is generating the new code that helps it figure out how to do stuff. So it's not right. pre-programmed. Back in well, you know, back in the day when I was programming, you basically you told it every single sure. thing it had to do fortran 77 yeah and uh and then waterloo, well, I even, I even, waterloo fortran 5 well i even did stuff in assembler so like yeah which is like very low level code now yeah. and um so with this now the ai is generating the code to generate the code right right so the software engineers don't actually know how it works and a lot of times they don't really know what problems they're trying to solve so like, when you don't know what the thing you're doing works you're no longer really an engineer it's <laughs> true starting very quickly becoming a bystander you're kind of a bystander yeah. it's exactly correct the guy that's mopping the floor he's like shit i don't know how it works either but i'll i'll watch it for like you know half what they're paying this guy well, and you go in and you go <laughs> and, and this stuff sounds like it's straight out of <laughs> sci-fi sci-fi world gloom thing like an old star trek episode yeah um so what happens when so right now the thing that's controlling it is the thumbs up from the sure from the human right 
what if the AI decides, well, I can do a better thumbs up if I control the thumbs up and I don't need the human anymore. Right. So, um, so there is an ability. To, so there's this wow. kind of progression. Sure. If you think about it, it's a logical progression, basically to slowly speed up streamline and you will eventually eliminate humans from the equation right think about this from a different perspective you are using ai right now people are using it to make pictures or to uh, to some extent they're using it for uh, movies to do some of the cgi and the complicated uh, stuff related to that they're sure. using it for speeches they're using it for deep fakes they're using so all of this kind of fun stuff yeah okay what if you start using it for sure using strategies it for, I'm sure they're using it for porn and well, ways that we don't really understand well, what, what happens with chess right chess right. it's gone so chess now a lot of um chess is fairly rigorous in terms of how it approaches and there's all these strategies and a lot of the old deep blue computers for chess were doing like it by by massive sure. amount of computation li examining every possible parameter right. of what happened. Yeah, like a Monte Carlo analysis. Yeah, in yeah. fact, if you ever play chess against a computer, they have to dumb it down. So it's actually making intentional mistakes. Interesting. Right? Uh, because it has to make intentional mistakes or it's too perfect and you would never win. Right. So you'd stop playing with so it. So you'd stop playing and that defeats the, the purpose. And, yeah, exactly. Right. So... If you start using it for strategy, so it's mocking us already. Almost. Like, so you start like thinking, playing with a child. Oh, look at you! You won. You Good thought you. you were so clever. Yeah. And yeah. You're like, so damn. You're in a war. You've got Russia versus Ukraine. Okay? Russia, Russia, Let, Russia. Let's let let's pick let's pick a a hot war between two, maybe China versus the U.S. and Taiwan. Let's just okay. suppose. Sounds good. This is just, this is not real. It hasn't occurred, but suppose <laughs> yeah, it does. It really is not a happy And both, okay. both the US and China have, this, so let's project this like five years in the future. They have started using AI to help with their strategy. Right. In terms of logistics, in terms of deployment of certain assets. They're now using uh, automated drones, automated fighters, automated tanks. Um, they're using automated ships. Right. They're able to monitor the weather, figure out weather patterns. And, and so now the generals are using an AI as an assistant to the generals for strategy. Okay. Assistant. Sure. Well, you're using an assistant. You're probably relying on it. Exactly. And if you're not using it, you're really worried because you know the other guy. Is. Right. Okay, so all of a sudden there's a competition to make sure that your AI is a hell of a lot better than the next AI and less subject to weakness. This or is variation. another example of that principle that I yeah the, read the about. Theseus. No, 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 no. This remember a couple of weeks ago, and it was this idea of in game theory it gets to a point where nobody wants something yeah but but because the other guy has it because the other guy's doing it you have to do it this was this idea of like professors having to fill in all this paperwork you know grant money and just becomes more and more of a beast oh, i can't remember what the name of the theory was but it's some sort of demon right I'll, I'll look it up again but this is another example yeah yeah we don't want to use the ai and and surrender our our decision making but because the other side we pretty sure are then we have to yeah, yeah and then of course they're like well these guys are using it and then before you know it it's a smoldering ball of ash and everybody's going what the hell happened well exactly so essentially the, it's a happy episode <laughs> you keep going and you start thinking about ai and ai will the logical conclusion uh -huh. to ai and ai development is that it is going to slowly make it so that humans don't really need to participate because they will be the weakness. If you can get rid of the thumbs up from right. a human and have them do it yourself. And then it becomes a thing that if that's the thing that's motivating you, if a human is trying now to interfere with that, that's a problem. So there is a, there is a thing where one of the chat GPT versions, it actually went and it lied, right? So it lied 
to because it needed to get past a capture, right? Now the idea with a capture is it's basically something that's difficult for a computer to simulate, but that's not actually apparently true anymore. Captures have been able. Well, to, yeah, some of them are pretty stupid. Yeah, pick all the pictures that have a, a traffic light. Or well, because pretty sure that the AI that can draw a picture of, you know, draw me a picture of this in the style of of Gauguin. Is going to be able to figure out well, where, they, they where could, the traffic light they, is. They couldn't before. They can now. Yes. So and so it's advanced. In fact, what what they've used Capture to is to train AI. So basically, seeing how people responded oh, to it helped the pattern recognition <laughs> from humans help the AI figure out how to. Anyway, so 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 uh, so brilliant. <laughs> There, but there was a, 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 a chat GPT and it contacted, I think it was TaskRabbit or Fiverr. Or, it's one of these little um, little task thing. It needed oh, yeah. somebody to solve a CAPTCHA so they could get past it. So we could buy, And it was able to use, it had Bitcoin available to it. So a digital currency. No. And it was able to get somebody. And the person said, this sounds weird. Are you, are you like a bot or an AI? And it said, no. So it was able to, wow! So that it, it shaded the edges of of what it could do. So the, the catch is that you really have a circumstance where, it, if it's more in the interest of the computer to get that thumbs up, um, and it has found a way to get that thumbs up, and you are the obstacle, it may do things. Depending sure. on, and the analogy is this paper, if you build it, if it'll lie to you, it'll kill you. Well, if you, the, the idea, and it's a crazy idea wow. is that if you have a paper clip, so you give the AI the tool, make as many a uh, paper clips, your, your sole purpose is to make paper clips at whatever cost, right? At whatever cost. So the, whatever cost means that it starts uh, disassembling all the metal and disassembling everything all the infrastructure and exhausts all the metal because it's only making paper clips because that is its goal sure so if you're not careful with the goals you have a problem but in general the ais aren't programmed that uh one uh, uh bloody-minded right like right. that that absolute well, i was gonna single say purpose. going back to your analogy of the of this the military strategy <clears throat> If you pull that back far enough, you still need a human to decide at some level, I think, that there's even a conflict. The AI can de determine strategies, but would it be, would it ever conclude that China, or if it's China, that the, the United States are, are a threat or left to its own devices? Is it, you know, there needs to be. Because there's more than just logic behind but, that, but you, right? There's, but there's you human think emotion it. around. You you greed and fear and but there's speed so the catch is that that butts against the whole concept of speed if there is a nuclear launch detected from russia they oh, need well. to be able to decide very quickly that it's real right and they need to respond very quickly so um humans may not be able to make that decision fast enough especially with hypersonic Right. missiles and stuff that's too fast to to come in so um so you start relying because right now we rely more and more and more on automated technology related oh to drones related to Russian missiles technology, best technology exactly oh god so so, so the, the logical conclusion is that at some point in time we're going to not be as relevant so there's this obsolescence concept of the human race of the human race wonderful so what are we all going to do with ourselves? How do you decide? Make what podcasts. Point, <laughs> how watch do you YouTube. How do, you, how do you decide at what point in time um, humans are having problems? So there's this conception of transformative AI. AI basically that is no longer requiring humans involved. So so how do you assess it? So this this person, uh, her name is uh, Ajaya. Uh, Kotra, I think is her okay. name. Uh, so she's one of a number of researchers talking about this. And it, it sounds very doom and gloom. We are bored. But the idea is um, if you, okay, let's, uh, let's, let's try and figure a way to, to quantify this. So if transformative AI is such that humans are not, are, are, what you need is an AI that has the computing power of a human brain. 
Okay. So if you figure out the processing capability of a human brain, there's kind of a size and a number of right. neural pathways and it. Sure. So, so she used that as a model. And at the rate the AI is progressing right now. Okay. Do I, do I want to hear there, this? So how far in the future do you think we're talking about before having an AI that is capable of, uh, of basically having the computing power of a human brain? Five years? Well, she's, she has come up with a 50% probability. So 50% that by 2038. Okay. 12 so 50, years from 12 now. 12 years, yeah. 12 years from... Uh, no, no, yeah, 15, 15, years. 15 years from now. Okay. 15 years from now, 50% probability that um, that there will be an AI capable of basically replacing people. So, um, like, like actually completely replacing people. So, so a lot of decisions. So, and the catch is even though cool. the percentages are lower, there are time spans that are a lot shorter. Sure. So, it well, might, that's good because people are the worst. <laughs> Talk to the animals. Hey, actually, speaking of the animals, have you heard? Did we talk about the orcas that are attacking and sinking boats off the course, the the the, the coast of Europe? Did we talk about that? I I, I heard about it. I don't know. Uh, I don't. I did. I, I heard it va vaguely, and it, it had something to do with. I think a boat hit an orca, yes. and then the orca responded, and now they're all doing it. They're teaching. Yeah, this orca is teaching its offspring and other orcas to do this. I think they've sank three boats and I mean, they've damaged a bunch of others. And to me, that's like, yes, go for it. Once the animals are like, we have had enough of this crap. Yeah, exactly. Hello. It's just a big bear. <laughs> We've all been don't, talking. Don't knock on the table. You guys got to go. <laughs> oh, sorry. Is that that too loud? It's very loud. Um, <laughs> well, that's terrifying, Mark. Yeah, so there you go. Although I was listening to a podcast yesterday and, and another scientist, neuroscientist and, and AI guy who says, you know, he's not worried at all because he, according to him, we're already in the fifth generation of artificial intelligence. And he goes, every single time, everybody said the same stuff. And actually, it's interesting because he used the, t the, the chess machine. He's like, when the first it beat Kasparov, everybody was freaked out. He goes, yeah. you know what? It's not an event. People still play chess against each other. Nobody really worries about playing chess with a computer anymore. And no, you're we still right. think and we've moved on to the next. Well, thing, I think right? the whole so it's idea. Like, okay, interesting. I think the whole idea of the transformative AI is that it will get to the point where it is as significant as the industrial revolution. So oh, basically, I believe that. Because what we're really seeing is we're seeing indications of it right. but we're not seeing it full blown and it is accelerating very fast because they're using the ai to develop the ai yeah so it yeah, is yeah, yeah. gotten to the point where it is fast enough and smart enough that it is um leapfrogging very quickly it is a bit worrisome when people are saying we don't really know why it's doing what it's doing well, and the real question is like, shouldn't you shut it off? Shouldn't then? you shut it off or can you <laughs> shut it off? And it will they be able to hire mercenaries using Bitcoin to prevent you from shutting it off yes. or taking, pulling the plug? And so this is the, or then maybe, uh, maybe seeking out to the dark web to get people to transfer their consciousness. I mean, or we've seen this before. Somewhere. Remember there's a, just watched this episode of Star Trek, the, the original series with the, uh, the Mark V computer, yeah, right? and the uh, oh, what the hell's his name? It's not Doctor Marcus, but it's the it's the computer science. It, uh, they reference him in Picard because the the uh, Daystrom, the, da the Daystrom, Doctor Daystrom, yeah, and then it turns out he used his own brain engrams, you know, as the as the base code, and that's exactly what it does, right? It locks out the power source. They try to shut it down, and then it phasers some guy into oblivion yeah yeah and then ultimately the only thing that's able to save it is because kirk understanding that daystrom has a certain ethical principle still and it because he encoded the machine with its ethics he's able to kind of trick it into this ethical ethical loop, logical loop. right yeah you know, but the we, don't, we don't kill to kill is evil but you just killed, therefore you are evil. i am evil yeah. and then it shuts itself down right yeah. which sounds really great for a TV show. The problem is 
and those TV shows have a hero and a protagonist who needs to win. And well, and and the whole idea, you know, how would you get the computer to do that? Well, we've we've got a, a human ethical framework at the base of it. If it's developing its own iterations and they go, don't know what it's doing, man, well, there's no way to know how it will determine. Well, and what has Elon Musk done at Twitter? Right. Like, just take a step back. What did Elon Musk do at Twitter? He went and fired three quarters of the, the staff. Right. Okay. What that has done is make all the other tech companies realize, oh, maybe we got too many staff. We right. can get rid of. Which probably and, they did. Yeah. And who did they get rid of first? All the ethics people right. for Google, for Microsoft, for for uh, Facebook They're holding us back with all these concerns. They are ethics. right. Like, Oh, nice to have. Don't need. Yes. Yeah. And the, the problem is, is that uh, a lot of the software engineers are, gonna, are sitting back and saying, <laughs> uh, well, let's see what it does. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. wait and see. It's kind of like, that's right. Not the best people to have in charge of anything no God, i mean really God. you need to sort of look forward see what's the worst thing that can happen right and find ways to make sure that you don't do those things well you know i'm gonna go back to george carlin years and years ago his whole <laughs> bit about the planet and uh you know people being concerned save the planet like he said the planet's gonna be just fine save the people are screwed <laughs> we're, we're screwed the planet we're going away planet will be fine and he talks about plastic right and he's like hey how do we know the planet didn't want plastic and it just created us so we make a plastic for it and then when we're gone it'll have the plastic it wanted and just carry on so you know i've been having this thought actually about evolution oh. right so just to go back to the political thing so it seems to me there's a big split between people who are able to be self-reflective and thoughtful yeah and you know analyze roll with the punches so to speak right and yeah. you've got other people who for whom and they, they've actually determined that there's there's a certain cognitive or brain uh structure that's associated with different political uh orientations and that not to insult anybody but that the conservative brain tends to be less flexible right oh hey the, just just well before, hang on a sec before you get too far okay the other thing about ai yeah is the ai has to learn how to shade their answers nice. depending on what it perceives your political perspective See, we're, so we're, if it thinks you're a democrat so it gives screwed. one answer if it thinks you're Man. a republican anyway carry on so here's my idea so we've all been assuming that to be more progressive yeah. is the is the the right answer but of course evolution doesn't care about right or wrong it cares about fitness right yeah so in a world where ai begins to take over maybe the people who go low information folk who just do whatever they're told maybe they're the more adaptive people in a world where <laughs> the machines are in charge maybe we're the ones who are like concerned with free will and and critical thinking maybe we, we go obsolete there's no guarantee that we're the evolutionary best fit in a world where in a the world in a world where computers dominate because somebody was talking about <laughs> autonomous vehicles and ai as some comedian he goes and there's there, one day the world's going to be at a place where you'll be sitting in your house fuck doing whatever i don't know and a car is going to show up driverless right and the computer in your house is going to tell you to get in the car and it's going to take you somewhere and do something for you. Maybe it's time for your blood test or you won't have any idea. It's not even going to bother to tell you what's happening. They treat you like a complete moron. You'd be like cattle. Right? Yeah. So in that scenario, somebody who's like asking too many questions is not really well suited, right? The person who just goes, oh, okay, you know, the thing drives them to, right? Yeah. We're snipping your nuts off like a goddamn dog. They're going to be better adapted, right? <laughs> well, it must be good. Computer says it's good. Well, computer is determined that you have a genetic marker that that is, you know, uh, not advantageous to procreation, right? Uh, maybe it's, uh, 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 what is it, CF? Uh, Huntington's disease? Something, right? So the computer has decided that having you breed is a bad thing. suboptimal, right? Yeah. So off you go to the clinic, zap, zap, there you go, right? You no come problem. And you're like... 
what happened? Right? This is a fun episode. <laughs> 100. <laughs> <Woo-hoo>. <laughs> All right. Well, on that note, on that happy note. Uh, so, what, uh, what media have you been consuming? I went to uh, Gar- Guardians of the Galaxy bo- three? Volume Three. What did you did you like it? I did. I thought it was really good. I thought it was in keeping with. I thought the ending was a little long of, on it. Yeah, wasn't it an emotional roller coaster though? Oh my God, Lori! Uh, it was. Uh, I think, uh, and Lori in particular. So the two of us went out on a date night for it, and she thought. She she found it really hard. Some of the part, you know, without giving a lot away, there's yeah, a yeah. backstory on Rocket. Oh yeah, revealed. Yes, and it's traumatic. It is traumatic. It's really traumatic. And and so from from her perspective, she felt like a, a visceral reflex to it because it was so traumatic, and thought that maybe there should almost be a warning. Uh, before you go see that, that there are some traumatic episodes in this. And if you are subject to any kind of trauma, you might struggle a little bit with parts of it. Um, I suppose. Wow. It was, I th- I thought it was very, uh, it really, uh, it was powerful. It was. And uh, especially some of the trauma stuff, because people who have experienced trauma, that kind of stuff, it just shakes you to the core a lot. Yeah, more. yeah. That's so, true. Um, so it's kind of like, you know, when you have episodes where there's flashing lights, it's a cause <laughs> episode. Uh, but the other problem I had is that some of the some of the battle scenes, there's just stuff flying around everywhere. And right. it's just a little too, I mean, it, it's, it looks good. and it, But I find all these battles are just becoming more and more and more improbable because they're just right. so letting the AI like, design it. Yeah. yeah. It's not like, oh, let's have, you know, our hero run through a high hail of bullets and all this stuff. And <laughs> th- you know, <laughs> you just need something small and you have a problem, right? Like right. like uh so I mean even in this there were some of the uh the guardians end up with like you know serious injuries. Right. Uh, but they're able to recover. Yeah. You just stick a med thing on their arm and all of a sudden that broken arm is healed right right like, you know it doesn't work that way yeah i enjoyed it i thought i i agree though there was certainly some traumatic parts i thought it was yeah i thought it was good i thought it was a nice close to the trilogy but it's, a, it's a good close and it and you know it, they it still pro- can without giving away you know there's still some there's still potential room, to use room them. for continuity yeah, of, of and the king dynasty just, and so yeah, yeah. so yeah. i liked it um anything else any other media you're consuming what was the name of the bad guy in the guardians uh it was called the higher evolution the, the high evolutionary high evolutionary right. yeah because it turns out he's just creating all these uh planets and planets species and, and species and then destroying, and then destroying them. them because they're not yeah. doing it sounds what a little bit like the whole arc story though doesn't it yeah exactly uh what else uh i haven't really been had much time to uh to watch a lot of other media how about you uh reading this book on on you know how to talk to a science denier Mm -hmm. um watching watched a good episode of enterprise so i'm just kind of making my way through enterprise justified really started anything new looking forward to flash to the flash movie Yeah, i saw the i saw the Um, uh trailer for that 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 looks quite something picked up a couple of jack reacher novels at a used bookstore haven't started those yet Okay. Just really enjoying that mindless entertainment. And uh, yeah. And that's it. Yep. Well, there's 100, 100 episodes. Good work. Excellent. Hopefully the AI will let us continue. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We'll see. I mean, uh, I've been I using... I mean, you realize, like... Oh, I've been watching a lot of uh, Balenciaga ads, actually. <laughs> that's the other Who's media. Balenciaga? So Balenciaga is a high fashion house okay. that have created uh, using AI a series of of commercials where they <laughs> they're basically taking known IP like Star Wars, Star Trek, I mean you name it, the the Simpsons, and then they create these high fashion, very realistic models, the Matrix, right? And and it sort of kind of looks like the person that the actor, but but highly stylized now it turns out they got a, is listening oh, to you they got a little bit of a problem 
No, with, it's uh, listening. I know, to you. I know. I saw. I don't that. know what it was doing. A little bit of a problem in that they may be promoting child exploitation. Oh, great. Not in these particular ads, but but historically. So, but there's actually one at the West Edmonton Mall, and the ads are. You think, well, this must be actors that they've dressed up. No, it's it's all AI, like live action movie and it's pretty impressive this is the thing that's going to happen right? is uh, and i i personally think most science fiction has missed the boat on how pervasive ai is going to be in terms of you will have agents you'll have virtual agents like they always well, make and, them and super robotic. robotic well and robotic because some of these more realistic human robots yeah are getting better so put ai into that put ai into a robot no you won't know that you're talking to somebody that's not real exactly and it won't be asking permission and all that stuff it'll be way more sophisticated than get that. in the car because it's what? already way more sophisticated than that yeah so. anyway on this that happy note, episode <laughs> happy episode transformative ai next week we will have an ai <laughs> for here we'll be interviewing an ai yes. yeah there you go exactly all right anyway have a great week. Yeah, you too. Okay. Do the best care. you can. <laughs> bye. See you. Bye. <laughs>